I want to turn in your Bibles for the next few minutes to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, we're going to look at three verses, verses 16 through 18. Romans 6, 16 through 18. Paul, in writing the Romans and teaching them what they needed to do to get out of sin, he writes, writes this, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of, of sin, but have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered to you. And being made, perfect, or made free from sin, ye became the servants of unrighteousness. So if you notice in these verses, it gives us how to get out of sin. But we're going to serve either sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. The matter of obedience is, has been devalued in today's religion so much. Uh, I don't listen to a lot of different religions and what they say, but I, occasionally I'll turn on the radio and I'll hear a, a message going on from somebody, and I'll listen to it for a few minutes. And some of them uh, have pretty good lessons, they're on track to a point, and then they'll just slide right off the deep end on something that is just an own personal belief or their particular doctrine of their religion. And it's, a lot of things are devalued today when you start looking at religion. Obedience is devalued. I've heard people say, well, I know what I feel in my heart. It doesn't matter if I go out and say this, if I talk this way, or if I act that way. God knows my heart. I had a guy tell me that one day. And I said, God does know your heart. And your heart's not right with him. If you're going to act this way or talk this way or live this way, we can't just do what we want and think that God's going to be pleasing with us because he's not. Some even call it legalism if we emphasize doctrine and obedience. That we're legalistic because we're trying to put too much on a person what God said. No, we're not. If we say what the Bible tells us to do, then we're doing exactly what God said to do. If we tell too little or we preach too little about what God says, we're not going far enough. If we go more than what God said, we're going too far. We can only do what God's Word teaches us to do. We have to speak where the Bible speaks, and we must be silent where the Bible is silent. And yet today people will speak where the Bible is silent and they're silent where the Bible speaks and they think their obedience is not based upon the Bible but their own feelings in their own hearts. And that's just not going to be the case. By Paul's words, we can hardly see where to stop emphasizing obedience. And you look at it over and over again throughout the entire New Testament. The Bible teaches obedience. And Paul is emphasizing it here not only in Romans 6 but in the entire book of Romans. He's emphasizing obedience to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, over sin in general, or even, as a lot of this book covers, going back under the law of Moses or following tenets of the law of Moses. Now, there are a couple of choices that we have. We can, according to verse 16, obey sin unto death, die in disobedience, or... We can serve obedience under righteousness. Do what God said and be saved. Those are the only two options, folks. It's either we're going to live in sin and go to hell, or we're going to live righteous in God and go to heaven. There's no other in-between place. There's no other options to follow. It has to be one or the other. And yet when you talk to people in this world, they think there's a third option. Well, just do what you feel in your heart and it's going to be okay anyway. Years and years ago... I was preaching in a little town in Alabama, really small town. Uh, you could fit one block of, the, of spring in the whole town. But anyway, we had a little local newspaper. And there are a couple of people that were writing religious articles, and I could only stomach reading some of the stuff they said so much. So I started writing an article. I contacted the editor, and I said, I'd like to do a weekly article in the newspaper. So I started writing an article, or writing articles. And I had some person from Florida send me a response to one of my articles he didn't like too well. And his response was because I was talking about the headship of the family as man and leadership in the roles in the church as men. And he called me misogynist and I hated women. He had a little handwritten nasty note to me. But he sent me a newspaper clipping from some paper in Miami. I think it may have been the Miami Herald. I can't remember. Anyway, it's one of the major newspapers in, in uh, Miami. And the article was basically on the fact he said, we don't know what to do. And this is a supposed preacher writing these articles. And the article basically said, we don't know what to do. Just do the best you can and guess at it and God will figure it all out in the end. 
Now that was the gist of about a half a page article in that newspaper that was sent to me. I still got that article somewhere. I saved it. I didn't want to throw it away, especially a little note on the back to me. I wanted to keep that too. But anyway, reading that, he basically said the Bible can't be trusted. And that was part of his, his article. The Bible can't be trusted because men got a hold of the Bible and you don't know what's right and wrong. That's why you just live however you want to live and let God sort you all out in the end. I don't want to do that. I don't want God to sort me out in the end and I did what I thought was the best I could and I did it wrong. I want to do what is biblically correct what is right according to His law. We're servants, and we're going to be servants of one or the other. And the importance lies in our destination. It's either going to be life, spiritual life in heaven, or it's going to be death. It can't be just whatever we want. You go down to Romans chapter 6 and verse 21, it says, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. It's either going to be death or it's going to be righteousness. Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 6 through 8 said, I'm ready to be offered at the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Now notice verse 8. Henceforth, in other words, is a crown of life is going to be given to me, but he said, not to me only, but all them that love is appearing. Paul said, I'm going to receive a crown of life. I know I am because of the way I've been living. We can be assured of our salvation. We shouldn't go around thinking, well, I might be saved. I hope I am. I really don't know. You better know that you live in the Christian life faithful enough that you will go to heaven when you die. And Paul had that assurance. He had that assurance of knowing he is faithful to God and he served him and he knew that God would give him a crown of righteousness. He said, but it's not going to be just to me. But he said, everybody that loves us appearing, everyone who is faithful in their service to God. But we also need to understand that Choices can be made and our states changed. And when you look at verse 17, But God be thanked that ye were, past tense, the servants of sin. But now, present tense, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered to you. He said, in other words, you were sinners, you were lost, you were doomed to hell, but I'm thankful to God that you saw what you needed to in, in hearing the word of God, you heard the preaching, you obeyed the preaching from the heart. Notice that it does come from the heart. You have to want to do it and intend to do it and do it right. And he said, you'll have a crown of righteousness awaiting you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, Paul told the Corinthians, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now notice what he says in verse 11 about them. And such were some of you. But you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You were sinners, but you made a change of state. You've turned your life around by obeying the gospel. You're no longer living that old sinful life. Now you're obeying righteousness. Now you're washed. You're sanctified. You're justified. That's what the state that we all need to be in today. Over in Colossians 1.13, David talked about this this morning in the Bible class. When he said, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son? He delivered us from darkness. What is darkness? Sin. When you read about darkness in the Bible, it's not referring to physical darkness, it's referring to spiritual darkness, a state of sin, a state of lostness. But he's translated us. That word translated is you change from one state to another. You've been brought from a different place to a new place. And He's translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. We have the kingdom of Jesus Christ here today. And we're part of that kingdom if we've obeyed the gospel. And God blesses us as we live a faithful life. These folks obeyed from the heart. There was no hypocrisy, no reservations, no, well, did I do what was right? I'm just not sure. I hope I did what was right. No, when you change states from being lost to being saved and there's no hypocrisy involved you have no reservations you know that you did what was right 
You're not holding back because Matthew 6, 24 says we can't serve two masters. You're either going to love one and hate the other, hold to the one or despise the other. You cannot serve God in mammon. We need to make the choice to serve God. Then you go to verse 18. That state has been changed from, to be free from sin. He said in verse 18, Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. As a result of being freed from sin, now we're servants of God in a state of being blessed. Matthew 26, 28 tells us that comes by the blood of Jesus Christ. Acts 2, 38 tells us and those on Pentecost who believed were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. And then they'd be saved from those sins. They'd have their salvation. And that can happen with us today, with those today who have not done that. You have not done that. If you with all your heart believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you're willing to change your life in repentance, turn from a life of sin, go from that, sin, that state of darkness, sin, the state of being lost and doomed to hell, to a state of being saved, walking in the light, enjoying the blood of Jesus Christ, one day to look forward to home in heaven as we remain faithful in our service to Him. As a child of God, if you've wandered away in your life and not living the way you should be living, why not come back today why not make those necessary changes? If you've sinned publicly, then come publicly asking God to forgive you. Change your life in that repentance and live a faithful life so that heaven can be your home. If you are subject in any way to the Lord's invitation, come right now. Why together we stand and why we sing?